favorite creative pair of comic talents of all time. Uh, those of you who are in the room clearly know who you're here to see. Uh, and they are prepping right now. They're busy making some arrangements for a little special surprise. Uh, they're going to unleash on you as we go. <laughs> so we'll give you a moment to be so patient here for a second. They're going to come in here. Apparently, my job at this convention is to come in here and dance <laughs> like a monkey whenever Stan's running late. So, so come we are, on. We're doing our best. We're on our way. Yeah. 
did 12 page romance where the girls looked like bony men. <laughs> and I fell asleep three times trying to finish a page in that week, two weeks over. The worst story Stephen Douglas, who was the editor of uh, uh, Famous Funnies, has a had a stack like this of artwork on his, on his desk of young artists doing their first stories that he never printed. Wow. I went right on that. <laughs> That's why Famous Funnies went out of business. <laughs> well, he's in heaven, I'll tell you. And when I get to heaven, I'm going to tell him, thank you, Steve. I got to ask you more than I ever would have done, <laughs> John. I got to ask you. You were you were infamous for not, and this is crap. We all love your work, but you're infamous for not liking your own work, and you're infamous for 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 always feeling like you should be moving faster on stories. You, I was never never fast. No. So my my question is: so at the so the very first story you ever did, this little twelve page romance story, you get to the end of it. I can only imagine. How frustrated you must have been at the experience. Did you? Did, was there ever a moment where you thought, "I don't want to be a comics artist for a living"? Let me tell you. When I finished that twelve-page story, I thought to myself clearly, "I don't think I can think up another panel. I don't think I can decide what to do in another panel after doing that many panels." It was not a fast thinker. <laughs> By the way, you made a mistake. Yes. My wife always corrects me on that. You said you thought to yourself. I used to say that, and my wife said to me one day, what do you mean you thought to yourself? Who else could you think to? But you <laughs> so always remember that. You don't think to yourself. You just thought it saves you two words, it saves you time. <laughs> I'm sorry, I interrupted. I tend to do that. That's why I never became a writer. <laughs> I mean, that's the answer. I, I could only do artwork with somebody else gave me the words. Hmm. So you so you started sort of unofficially at Marvel, sort of under the radar in the late 40s and early 50s. And at what point did did John come onto your radar in terms of knowing, recognizing him as a talent, knowing he was a, knowing he was somebody you wanted to work with? You talking to me? He won't remember that. He won't remember that song. No, I tell you what my problem. He didn't know that either. That's my problem is I don't hear that well, <laughs> and when you talk into this microphone, it sounds to me like. And <laughs> what So if you have anything you say to me, put the goddamn microphone. Down. <laughs> I don't remember meeting this man at all. <laughs> I don't remember meeting people. I don't have that kind of memory. But I'll tell you about working with him. But do you mind if I don't tell how we met? Do you know how we met you? Or you tell that and I'll get around later to meeting with you. <laughs> what happened is I worked for, for him through this other artist for about seven or eight months. And then I got drafted. I went into basic training. And uh, about six or seven months later, I was able to leave Governor's I was working on Governor's Island with uh, recruiting posters. Uh, I, in uniform, I was allowed, I had a class A pass, I was allowed to go on the ferry, go up town, I go to, to Marvel Comics, it wasn't Marvel Comics, it was China, China then. Uh, and I go in, and uh, this beautiful secretary that he always had uh, comes out, and I said, Stan's, I've been working for Stan for about a year, but he doesn't know me. I said, remind him of Zachary, less to Zachary's work. She goes in, she comes out with a script, a four page script. And uh, she Anything you get rid of you. <laughs> so he gave me my first job that he knew my name was John Leader. No. Still didn't do it. <laughs> so that's why he came. I told you, yeah, remember, you remember. there was no time to print to see it. The girl brought it out and told me to ink it, and I had never inked it before. So after I felt faint for a while, I said, to hell with it, I'll fake it. <laughs> Seems well, you mean I gave you a script and I had never met you? You never met me, but you saw my artwork in six yeah. Well, your artwork was more interesting than you were. <laughs> <laughs> you. Uh, uh, Hardy used to say, it was ever thus. <laughs> what can I tell you? Um, uh, you see, now, when you talk into the mic, I can understand what you're saying, because your mouth is a little bit away from it. You talk like this, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really 
Alright, back. So, you, so, again, so you, you knew you were, you, you, you started working with John in the 50s on some of these stories. Um, do you have any, mem- do you, do you have any memories of working with him in the 50s? Any, any sort of... All right, I'm no good at historical things. I don't remember what his first brick was. I don't remember how we met. I mean, I'll tell you one thing I remember. This was the greatest man to work with that you could ever find anywhere. He has received so much less credit than he deserves for the Marvel Age of comics because any time anything was needed, if Kirby didn't bring in a job that he was supposed to, and I needed a guy to finish it quickly. If Ditko didn't have time to do a cover or do a strip, and I needed somebody to fix it. If Gene Colan needed, if we needed a strip that Colan was doing, but he couldn't do the next month. It didn't matter who the artist was that needed a replacement. All I had to do was give it to John Romita, and it was usually done as good or better than the original artist would have done. The only problem, the only problem is he was so good that I hesitated to give him his own strip to stay with because then I wouldn't have anybody around to do all the emergency stuff. <laughs> now, he could do anything. He could do penciling, he could do inking, he could do any script at all. He could draw gorgeous girls, he could do the best action scenes, and and I don't even like him personally. I mean, you can believe me, I have no reason to say this. I love this man. I will point out that that means I was highly underpaid. <laughs> But he was underpaid. I wasn't the guy. Everybody thought that I made up the pay rates. We had a boss named Martin Goodman, the stingiest man who ever lived. I was underpaid, but nobody ever noticed that. <laughs> he underpaid you, and you were a blood relative. <laughs> so, yeah, with some blood relative. I was, wait a minute, the publisher was my cousin's husband. It was a real close tie. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Well, so, right, so, you, could, you, so you spent some time at Marvel, obviously, in the 50s, and then when things started to peter out there, you went full-time at DC, right? You want, to hear, you want to hear the story that happened when, in 1958, when Marvel had to shut down to about two or three books? Right. Uh, I called up the stand secretary and said I had done about $100 worth of work on my last question, I'd like to about it. And she said, I'm afraid there's no chance. So when I got off the phone, I told Virginia, if Stanley calls, tell him to go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to work with DC. Right. Uh, I, I didn't keep that, that cold in the house, of course. And I never did tell you to work out, so you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> we still got time. So. <laughs> It's not, so, so you were there for about what five years at DC? I think seven years. My first. Do, I was, oh no, I was eight years. Eight years. years. Seven years at home. Right. Eight years, eight years at DC. Doing the the most beautifully <coughs> illustrated and most wretchedly written romance stories. Oh, they were. Well, actually, you you did you did either depending on how you count it. You either did hundreds of romance stories or you did the same exact romance story a hundred times. I can't look at those stories. That must have been... It was true, except for Bob Kanika stuff. Kanika did a series, we did two series. Actually, they were like soap operas. Yeah. A, a, a running story, a book on nurse uh, stories. Right. And a book on airline stories. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and I used to get things from Bob Kanika like, they're on skis at the crest of the hill. Yeah. And they kiss him. And I used to say to him, Bob, how the hell do you kiss on skis? <laughs> and he says, trust me, it's been done, I've done it. <laughs> now, anybody who ever met Bob Canning knows he never skied, let alone kiss the girl. <laughs> <laughs> but you never had the pleasure to meet Canning, but i got to tell you something about those romance stories. It'll break his heart because it has nothing to do with John at the moment. 
I used to write almost all the romance stories, but they were supposed to be confessions. And um, in other words, all the stories were supposed to be written by a girl confessing some terrible problem that she had in her love life. And I, as John knows, I like putting my name down on everything I've done. I have this penchant for enjoying seeing my name in print. And I wondered, how can I say by Stan Lee if it's supposed to be a girl who's telling about her love life? But how can I not put my name if I wrote the damn story? So I got an idea. And this is one of the few sneaky, tricky things I've done in my very upright and honest existence. <laughs> I came up with the idea of writing as told to Stan Lee. So on the front page of every story, it would say something like, my broken heart as told to Stan Lee. <laughs> Even today, I sometimes get letters tweeted to me, or factored, whatever it is they call it. Um, I saw one of your old romance books. What would make any girl tell all those things to you? <laughs> so I don't think I really got away with it, and that had nothing to do with what we're talking about. Forgive me for interrupting, but because I don't have a memory, I gotta just talk about whatever I know. I'm not as good as this guy. <laughs> So, so seven, eight years of what must have been, on a creative level, very dull, very boring in D.C., yeah. and, then, and then what happens? The phone rings? No, D.C. Uh, found a closet full of uh, inventory that had never been used. So much the same as so, having a marble like eight years previous. Same yeah. What they did is they closed down the romance department and said, you're a freelancer? Go freelance. Uh, no, no severance pay, no sympathy, no nothing. So I went into advertising for 48 hours. <laughs> I, I signed up with BBDO on a Thursday because one of my neighbors was an art director. And I that was an advertising agency. Some, Some people may not that know that. And That's right. And uh, I signed, and I was going to work with uh, one of my favorite artists. I can't remember his name now. Yes. One of the greatest artists. Uh, Oh, yeah. I was going to be in the next booth for more wow. Okay. And that was the reason I wanted to be there. Sure. I go to have lunch to say to Stan, I'm, I'm going to get out of comics. Uh, because he had called me hearing that I left DC. So he gets me to lunch. And he won't be paid for it. <laughs> you he took me to the governor restaurant in New York where there was the most expensive steak in the world. And he charmed me out of the trees. Yeah. <laughs> he spent three hours telling me how to be a, a, big, a big fish in a little pond, meaning comics, right. as being a little fish in a big pond, meaning advertising. And by the time we finished that meal, he had me calm. Yeah. He also guaranteed to, to match the salary of the PBD and all was going to pay me, whether I finished the pages or not. Okay. Which I found out later he had no no right to give me that. <laughs> I'd have been fired if uh, Martin found out. Martin was the publisher. But, but the big businessman who knows what he's doing accepted the deal. Yeah. So I find myself in comics, and I wonder where the hell I would have been five years later. I wonder would I have been one of the art directors on the DVD and all, earning enough money to buy my my whole family a new house. Uh, I'll never know. I will never know. Well, the artists at the agency, they, they were doing a lot of newspaper ads in comic form. Remember Stan Drake and artists like that? They don't do those ads anymore. And if you had stayed with them, you'd have eventually come knocking on my oh, door. They were 20 years, but they were doing storyboards. I think Mort Meskin was one of their chief storyboards. That was yeah. commercials. Yeah. And that would have led to new storyboards for movies. So it probably was not going to be a dead end. But I can't guarantee I would have been, I don't think I would have been entertaining this many people. No, no. Because our directors don't need crap. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm so where it's at. 
I think I made the right decision. I think you made the right decision too. Yeah. I'll tell you one thing about our publisher, Martin Goodman. This man was all heart. The day that he told that he had to let the whole staff go, he walked into my office and he said, Stan, I'm suspending publication for a while. I'm going to Miami. While I'm gone, I'd like you to fire all the artists. <laughs> this was uh, the best part of my job, getting to do things like that. And I will never forget. Twice, twice in my career, I had to do that. But luckily, we came back again, and uh, here we are. We fooled all of you people into buying our books. <laughs>
were synonymous, where if, if a creator went on, the strip died. There's no reason to keep going. And you, I believe you're quoted as saying, well, once Steve Ditko left Spider-Man, why are we still publishing Spider-Man? Well, I felt that way about Spider-Man. When I went to the, I was not smart enough to say that about I did say that about Jack Kirby. Yeah. I said, what the hell are you going to have to listen to the EFF? Yeah. Yeah. And I said, who the hell can do this? He said, you are. You are. Yeah. I told him I just came in in panic, and he tells me something else to make me more panic. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, with, with, with Disco, I felt if I ghosted it, right. if I made it look like it, because I really thought he was coming back. Yeah. I really? Couldn't, I, I could not, there wasn't another artist in the business that could have a three year success story right. gathering steam. Yeah. It was building every year. Yeah. Give it up. I never believed it. I said, think I will be back. I'll do a couple of issues, and I'll be back. I'm there, there, but I'll be happy. Here, here. <laughs> Never happened, and I finally, I finally stopped trying to ghost did go with a big headline. Yeah. And yet I took out my number five brush, and I started making big bold lines again. Yeah. No, you can tell. You can definitely tell in the first couple of issues of Spider-Man that you did. That you're, he didn't ask me to do that. No, but you, you, you're, you're, you're definitely... I felt obliged. Yeah. To ghost. If I were to take over uh, Flash Gordon, yeah. I would do it in our That's right. style. Yeah. I would do it in my style. Yeah. So I, in those days, we felt the obligation. Yeah. Keep it going. So what was the work process like back then? Did you did you write out plots? Did you just talk over plots with, with John? What did you do? I don't remember exactly. I think I either wrote out brief outlines or I would just talk to the artist for a while and say, this is what I think the story ought to be. Now go ahead and do it. Uh, by the time I got there, a uh, brilliant mind that I looked at, a steel trap that I have for a mind, I not only did a verbal plot session with him because I happened to be in the office every day. He would give plots sometimes over the phone to Jack. But he would write up synopses, one heavy page synopsis for a lot of other artists. But I was there, and he said, why write it up? I would just tell the jerk to do it this way. And the dumb thing about it is I never recorded it. Jack Corley was smart enough to come in and have him record a plot session. Oh, that's smart. I was not smart. I said, I'll remember. When I got home, two days after I got home, I'd say, I know we talked about two possibilities. Which one you <laughs> I'm really upset. I would have thought that what I told you was so brilliant that you could never forget. It, it was it was brilliant. But I re I remembered that we would discuss say two ways to do it. And Either way is okay. Both ways. Everything I say is brilliant. So <laughs> Some things I did, like uh, um, the first Spider-Man story we did, I did the Brooklyn Bridge. In the you scene. did what? I did the Brooklyn Bridge in the, in the scene, staying called the George Washington Bridge. So that's how coordinated we were. <laughs> but uh, I will tell what I tell everybody: no matter how wrong I was on the storytelling in my pencils, yeah. this man would take those pencils and make them look like every single thing, every nuance was planned perfectly. Like we plotted it down to the nuts and bolts. I would tell anybody who asks me, there is no writer in the world that could have done that. And he did it. Yeah. I used to say, God, it doesn't make sense. It's, it's got holes in that story. When I read the, the damn script he gave me, the whole thing looked great. <laughs> That's what I love doing the most. I love doing puzzles. And sometimes I get a script from Jack. And I would have told him briefly, Jack Kirby that is, I would have told him briefly what the plot was. But he put in a lot of things that I hadn't discussed with him at all. And I had to figure out what they were. And I had to write it as though it had all been carefully planned and structured and was part of the story. And I loved doing that. The more they threw in things that I didn't know about, the more I enjoyed writing the story because it made me think and work it out. And it was really fun. And of course, guys like John and Jack and Steve Ditko and all of them, they were so good at story themselves at telling a story visually that 
When you looked at the pictures, everything flowed together. It looked like everything belonged, even if it wasn't what I had told them to do. So all I had to do was put in the words to make it smooth and make it seem that's the way we planned it. It was really a good way of working, I think. Okay, just let me just interrupt you here. All you had to do. Oh, yeah. Let me just explain. It's 10 comics a month at 20 pages a comic. And I asked him the other night, I asked you last night, how long did it take you to dialogue a 20-page comic? About a whole day. And you would say, but yeah, about a whole day. And I'm thinking that's, that's, that is phenomenal, that you could hold well, down. Really, part of a day, I'd also go to a movie and be out with my wife. <laughs> During the day, I would do it. Sometimes you have two books when you work at home. Two books and he works at home. That is why I, I can't get eight pages. But it wasn't hard. The, te yeah. the 20 pages were all drawn. Yeah. All I had to do was put in the diet. Oh, I'll tell you another thing that I felt was incredibly important, and nobody seems to concentrate on that anymore. And that is the dialogue balloons themselves. It is so important to make the dialogue balloon part of the layout as though you're the artist. And if there's a big space, of, if there are two heads low down on a panel and they're just talking, and there's a lot of white space up above, you put in the dialogue balloons to fill up that white space artistically, but it gives you a chance to put a lot of thought balloons or dialogue balloons where you get to know the characters better. If there's a panel, if John drew a panel that was a great fight scene, I wouldn't put in much dialogue because you don't want to detract from the artwork. Now, a lot of writers today don't think of that at all. They know what they want to write, they put in the balloons, and it's almost like they don't notice what the artwork is. And that, to me, is the one thing that ought to be developed a little more at the comic book companies how to put in the balloons to make them an essential and integral part of the artwork itself. And I'm talking too much of it. <laughs> <laughs> Never stop being an editor. So, let me ask, I want to throw this open to a couple of questions while we got some time. But before I do, if I could ask you to, to repeat a story that, I, that, you, that you went at backstage. When we're talking about the nicknames that Stan gave the artists, Jack King Kirby and and Larry and Larry Weaver and, and so forth. John, Jazzy Johnny and Johnny Ring-a-Ding. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing was that he was giving me a, a literary of names, which makes sense. He hated them. You no, know, no, I didn't hate them. I, I just felt, in, I, I felt inadequate because Jazzy, to call me Jazzy, uh, even began my, with J. That's all the only <laughs> word I could think of. I, I knew why. My mother, for instance, was not sure. My mother, when she saw the, the, the credit line, she, I said, that's my nickname, he calls me that. And she said, you tell Mr. Stan Lee, everybody can be as jazzy as, jazzy as he is. <laughs> <laughs> she took it as a, as a sarcastic jive, uh, you know, and, and I couldn't make her understand that he was trying, just trying to make me have, and I, I did tell her this, I said, listen, don't, don't, don't knock it, because he gives me this in, in lieu of money. <laughs> <laughs> because this way I become well known and I will be a well paid artist in the future. But right now he just gives me a nickname and saves money. <laughs> You're lucky your mother read the comics. My mother didn't read them, my wife didn't read them, nobody in the family read them. I didn't say my mother read the comics, I just. She had to see it. <laughs> Is it okay with you if we open this up to the audience a little sure. bit? Who has some food? No, I'm not finished talking yet. <laughs> <laughs> if that was really, if that's what we're waiting for, then get a sandwich. <laughs> so, all right. Um, you sit right there, Debbie. Yeah, you. Yes, you. What's your question, sir? You right there in the glasses. There you the Probably challenge man like myself. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know how that. Uh, Shout it out. Uh, so I can't believe we're talking to the dynamic duo here. Thank you. Oh, you've been done to it. The build up to the introduction of Mary Jane is always, always one of the greatest pieces I've ever read. And uh, I always wondered, you know, um, Dicko, he never showed a face. We obscured.
here by flowers and stuff. What was the inspiration for finally revealing the great beauty that it made a male of Mary Jane? All we could make out was the name Ditko. Oh, all good, no problem. So Ditko, when Ditko brought Mary Jane into the strip, go and hide her face with a big flower or put her behind a curtain. It was always a mystery as to what she looked like. And then Ditko leaves the strip. So what was the inspiration to to make the big reveal? I am so glad Ditko left the strip before we saw Mary Jane, because Ditko could not draw pretty girls. <laughs> <laughs> It was so essential that Mary Jane look gorgeous. Only Johnny Romita could have drawn that panel, if you remember it. It was the last panel of the story. Peter Parker did not want to meet Mary Jane because his aunt had always said to him, there's this very nice girl next door, I'd like you to meet her. Now, no teenage boy wants to meet a girl who his aunt or mother says, oh, she's a very nice girl. <laughs> Teenage boys are not looking for nice girls. <laughs> so he had been avoiding you. Spy Peter had been avoiding her all the time. I was planning there would be one time when you get a look at her and she is dynamite. So we did that as the last panel in a strip. Peter couldn't help himself. He had to finally open the door and see Mary Jane. And there is one of the greatest pretty girl drawings Johnny ever did. And she has the line where she says something like, Face it, Tiger, you hit the jackpot. <laughs> well, can you imagine? Can you imagine if Steve Ditko, who is a genius in his own right, if Steve Ditko had drawn the girl and she had a safe again, face a tiger, you hit the jackpot, he slammed the door. <laughs> <laughs> any, any kids in the audience? Like, like young, young kids? Who's got a kid? There you go. What's your question, young man? Um. Where did your catchphrase Excelsior come from? That's a good well, I can't even say that's a good question. My comic book? Last night. <laughs> Where did your phrase Excelsior come from? I, I used to write little editorials and columns like Stan Soapbox and things, and I would end them with little expressions like whatever you do, wherever you go, hang loose, or face front, or any little expression I could think of. Little by little, I saw some of those expressions cropping up in DC books. <laughs> and I said, I've got to think of something that they won't know what it means, and they won't know how to spell it. <laughs> I happen to notice that the great seal of the state of New York, where I live, has the word excelsior on it, so I looked it up, and it's an old English word which means upward and onward to greater glory. I mean, what could be better? So I started using that, and they still don't know what the hell it means. <laughs> and make it look exciting. Nobody could put as much drama in a panel, and nobody could come up with concepts and costumes. In, um, in uh, S.H.I.E.L.D., when I was writing S.H.I.E.L.D., I think it may have been the first story, I don't remember, but I had an idea for some villains or robots or something, and I told Jack, but what he did, 
He created a group called Advanced Idea Mechanics, AIM, A-I-M. And they created some sort of a cyborg. I, don't, I didn't tell him about that. It was so great the way he opened the story with that, that robotic figure. And Jack could take anything and make it look exciting and make it look believable. And to answer your question, you're damn right he's missed. <laughs> chance because obviously there's 8 million of you and only two of them and only so many hours in the day. So they can't honor requests for autographs after the panel. However, they've been gracious enough to sign three of these Spy the Spider-Man prints. And so what I want to do is throw out some questions to the audience. Shoot up your hands if you know the answer. This is where your, your knowledge of Marvel history and John and Stan's history comes in handy. <laughs> We're going to get these away. All right. All right. My first question, and if you know the answer, shoot your hand and I'll call on you. Who was the first Spider-Man villain that the two of these two, that the two of these gentlemen created? You shot your hand up right off. You were, in, you were incorrect, sir. You, sir. You right there. No, I'm afraid not. Co-created. You, sir. Rhino. The Rhino is correct, Ooh. John, man. <laughs> yeah. what, was, what was the question? The question was, what was, which Spider-Man villain did the, the, the two of you co-create first? The first one, the Rhino. Right, yeah. I didn't call him rhinoceros because he wouldn't have known how to spell it. <laughs> <laughs> no, the thing is, he, he used to do it. He used to pin a card to my my drawing board every month. Usually, it was a one-word request: villain, rhino. The next villain was uh, uh, the, the uh, shocker. Yep. Mm -hmm. Didn't tell me anything else, just gave me a name. That was my outline. <laughs> you gotta earn your money somehow. Very close. That's right, that's what happens. Yep. Alright, so Daredevil was your first Marvel Age collaboration. Uh, I need an issue number from somebody. You were the first guy up with your hand. 16. I'm afraid not, sir. You? 12. 12 is correct. You are, you are correct, sir. <laughs> I have no idea what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> you're safe, don't worry. I think you're not. The first time you, the first time you did that, that's, that may be true. I think that may be the last one. Oh, that's right. That's at the last one. That's right. Exactly. You know what? But actually, I, I, think I, have better, I think I have a better one that we know, that we know for sure. What am I doing here? <laughs> Spider-Man strip in the 60s, right? You, you tried to do a Spider-Man daily strip in the 60s. That's right. Yeah. Oh, a newspaper, newspaper strip. It wasn't abortive. He did the greatest job no, in the world on that. It it's still so running. It was never so the first one. The first one was never so good. You mean the first one? We had, no. The first syndicated strip attempt we tried to sell. But Spider Man. But your Spider Man did run in the paper. It did, but the first one we did was never submitted. You mean you a, a did one of, that we didn't. Why didn't I submit it? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have to submit it. You left it to somebody, a vice president of the company. And we found out later he never submitted it. Oh, oh that crap! <laughs> <laughs> so 1977. The strip, the strip finally did use. And that's, that's it. Yeah, 1977, the strip. That's something I forgot to mention. Not only was he wonderful at, at comic books. Hey, I'm saying something flattering about you. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to it. 
I'm a guy, you say something nice about me, I shut everybody else up and listen with all ears. All right, so what I wanted to say, I didn't want to say it unless you were listening, is the one compliment I'll ever give you, probably. Not only was he great at, at comic books, he did the best damn newspaper strip, and if John had stayed with Spider-Man as a newspaper strip, it would probably be today the best-selling newspaper. He did what Kirby did in the uh, comic books. Every day it looked so great and so exciting. You know, I still look at those old ones. I could cry that he didn't stay with it, because it would have made me look good. Not that I care about you. <laughs> I had to get some sleep. <laughs> January 1977, Spider-Man newspaper strip. Your question is, who was the first villain? And you were first up. Go ahead. Doctor Doom. Doom is correct for the win, sir. <laughs> Sadly, out of time for this evening, but if you wouldn't mind giving a hand to these two.